Coming up on Small Town Big Deal. Okay, that was really cool. It's all aboard as we get fired up for a ride back in time on the steam-powered Small Town Express. Whoa! And then, right up there with electricity and air travel is this. There's over 4,000 products. I mean, it's endless. It helps feed the world and fuel its economy. Welcome to Small Town Big Deal. We've traveled across the country and firmly believe that the people in small towns are the hands that keep America strong. So join us, Rodney Miller and Jan Carl, as we show you the great things these people do on Small Town Big Deal. Welcome to Small Town Big Deal. I'm Rodney Miller. And I'm Jan Carl. And today we got a little riddle for you. That's right. So what weighs 160 tons? Yeah. Consumes almost 10,000 gallons of water a day. And is 110 years old but still going strong. Give up? From the iron horse that helped build America to Harry Potter's Hogwarts Express, few things have fired our imagination the way steam locomotives have. And today, with precious few remaining, nowhere can their power and beauty be experienced more than on the Strasburg Railroad, which begins just east of the village of Strasburg in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Every year, upwards of 350,000 people flock here to climb aboard this rolling museum and experience what life was like during the simpler era. So Steve, tell me what it's like to people when they first experience this train ride. Well, I think people come here and they have maybe different expectations, but there's a great experience for most people just to be able to kind of step back in time and enjoy a, a beautiful countryside that still remains today much the way it was, you know, a century or more ago. Steve Burrell is Strasburg's station master, and he's got the pipes to prove it. All aboard. He's got that really That's powerful good. voice. Okay, you do it. Oh, I can't do it like oh, that. Oh, come on. <laughs> All aboard. Okay. See, it doesn't sound like him. He's like, you need the hat. Forceful. You know? And you need the mustache. Yeah, I do. You really look it, too. I mean, you look the part, too. The railroad operates five coal-fired steam locomotives and 19 fully restored antique wooden passenger cars. Open daily, mid-March through October, visitors enjoy a 45-minute ride through the Amish countryside aboard open-air, coach, dining, or luxury cars. One of Strasbourg's most popular trains is a full-scale working replica of Thomas the Tank Engine. What is the reaction of children when they see Thomas? Kids go crazy. Strasburg's Thomas came to life in 1998, and that's thanks to the railroad's team of restoration experts led by Chief Mechanical Officer Rick Musser. And all they gave us was a matchbox model. No drawings, no pictures. They gave us a little really? matchbox model. So, like, model. here you go. Make this. Make this. Uh, oh, no. make, it, make it full scale. It has a face on it. The face, it talks. Uh, the eyes move. The mouth moves. <laughs> it's a very, very popular thing. This time we had all the wheels out of this, all the rods had to come off first. You know, the average age of Strasburg's steam engines is well over 100 years. So Rick and his crew have their hands full. Is it hard to find parts for these anymore? <laughs> yes. If you have, want to run these things, you have to have to make them yourself. You just can't call up your local yeah. steam locomotive dealer and ask for some parts. You can't, like, go on Amazon. Do you see the size of the tools in this place? You gotta be a man to work here. Uh, don't be so sure, Rodney. Meet Andrea Biesecker, who was hired by Strasburg right out of college as a machinist. Oh, I love my job. And I, I get all geeked out and goofy about it because I absolutely love my job. But Andrea's passion for old machines didn't stop there. And then once I got the job as a machinist, they were like, you know, if you want, we can teach you how to be an engineer. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Are you Wait, kidding? Wait, let me think about it. Yes. Yeah. And with that, Andrea went on to become the first female engineer in the 183-year history of the Strasburg Railroad. Okay, so in the dictionary next to girl power, there's like a picture of Andrea. 
What's the reaction when people come and a woman is the engineer? Well, I get it all the time. They point and say, it's a girl. <laughs> it's like, yeah. And I just wait. <laughs> What do you love when you yeah, are you. driving? Actually, it's an extreme rush and it's a lot of fun, but it's really nerve wracking all at the same time <laughs> because here I am in charge of 600 people. Yeah. And this multi million dollar train. Wow, this is a big responsibility. But at the same time, I'm all like excited because how cool is this? You know, pull the throttle, blowing the whistle, mm -hmm. waving at everybody. It's a girl. And. <laughs> It was a freezing cold afternoon, but Rodney and I weren't ready to leave this piece of history just yet. All that was left was for us to get in on some of the action. It is warm. Yeah, it's good. So with the winter sun setting and the temperature dropping, we headed out on a little run. And in no time flat, we were highballing down the line with a full head of steam. So somebody has to shovel a thousand pounds yeah. of coal in yep. there. Same guy does it all day long. As it turned out, that somebody shoveling all the coal was Rodney. And you're gonna hit the pedal with your left foot and throw it in there. And you can feel all the heat coming out of there. Yeah, I, think I'll, I think I'll leave that open. <laughs> and Jan, oh, she got awesome. to blow the whistle. Just pull it a little bit. Give it a tug. Okay, that was really cool. I shovel coal and Jan gets to pull the whistle. Typical day at Small Town Big Deal. As it should be. <laughs> Coming up. There's over 4,000 products. I mean, it's endless. It helps feed the world and fuel its economy. Welcome back to Small Town Big Deal. We are near the small town of Erling. Now that's in Shelby County, Iowa. And it was in these unassuming fields of corn where one of mankind's most important inventions took root. That's right. Most have never heard of Shelby County's claim to fame, but one man's out to change all that. Erling, Iowa is about 40 miles northeast of Omaha, Nebraska. It sits in the southwest corner of the state in Shelby County. That's the way it was. Oh. It's here you'll find Steve Kinkle, a fifth generation Iowa farmer. And like most Iowans, he's pretty humble. My whole heritage has been raising corn. But ask him about the kind of miracles that take place in these cornfields, and he'll put his Iowa modesty aside just for a bit. Time Magazine was doing an article, special edition, on mankind's greatest feats of the last 1,000 years. And right up there at the top was the invention of electricity, the airplane, and the invention of hybrid corn. You heard him right. He said hybrid corn. Yes, it's the same sweet corn people eat every day. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. And one of the misperceptions out there when people travel, they think all the corn out there is sweet corn. Less than 1% of the corn that's grown in the United States is sweet corn. But that other 99% of hybrid corn is known as field corn, and it touches our lives in some way, shape, or form every day. There's over 4,000 products made of corn. 4,000. We wouldn't exist the way we exist today <laughs> without it. I mean, it's, it's pure and simple. The list of hybrid corn products reads like a who's who of 21st century necessities. To keep up with demand, you need highly productive breeds of corn that are found today on farms everywhere. But most agree this humble Central American plant called Teal Cente is the ancestor of today's corn. Its ears were slightly larger than a quarter. Only after thousands of years of selective breeding did it start to resemble modern day corn. Still, by 1900, its yields paled in comparison today. It wasn't hardy or disease resistant. Then came hybrid corn. It started here. Shelby County was one of the leaders at the time for hybrid corn. And I ended up finding out that there was 18 seed corn companies here in Shelby County, really mom and pop family. The first of the companies started cropping up here in the 1930s. The word conscientious doesn't even begin to describe them. 
The work they did was tedious and backbreaking. The family owned seed corn companies of Shelby County spent decades meticulously breeding hardier traits into corn, making it stronger, more productive, and more disease resistant. So, for every thousand breeding attempts or so, you might yield one superior plant. And by doing that again and again and again, these farmers became the engine of a revolution that brought corn into our daily lives. The once prosaic Central American plant was bred into a super crop. Now grown on six continents, it helps feed the world and fuel its economy. In the U.S. alone, corn yields increased by roughly five-fold in 50 years. It's a testament to the hard work of Shelby County's hybrid corn pioneers. For Steve, it all hits home. It's in my own backyard, and we, it, it plays that huge a role. What started out as a quest to learn more about Shelby County's role in the development of hybrid corn ended up being a life-changing journey for Steve. He returned with a new understanding of Shelby County's role in the development of hybrid corn. Along the way, Steve picked up some vintage implements and memorabilia, like 1,200 seed sacks, for instance. I just started putting a few things on the wall, and then I went up in the rafters with the signs and then made a loft to start storing things and kind of add a little decor to the building. It just grew. It just grew. sort of germinated. Before he knew it, the machinery shed out back had evolved into Erling, Iowa's own hybrid corn pioneers museum. It pays homage to the hard work of the hybrid corn breeders of Shelby County and their predecessors. But these people, there was a lot more engineering and ingenuity than we ever gave them credit for. Today's equipment requires a lot of knowledge and expertise to operate. But after seeing how they raised corn a few hundred years ago, <laughs> man, we got it easy. Corn-related implements and artifacts of all shapes and sizes line the walls and cover the floors of Steve's museum. Some are centuries old, but each had a role in making our world a very different place. Yeah, this is one of the most unique pieces of equipment in my museum. It has three runners on it, here, here, and right down there. If you're gonna plant north and south, you're gonna start dragging this out, and you drug it with a couple horses, then you had to parallel it and go east and west. Look like a checkerboard square out in your field. Then the next day, you're going to go out and you're going to take what's called a drop planter. When they get to the cross section, they drop the seed. They go 44 inches, drop the seed. Go 44 inches, drop the seed. And I have so many of my farmer friends didn't even realize this is how it all started. Space here is at a premium, so Steve has decided that he'll donate his collection so it can be moved to a larger space in the future. It's a decision that compels him to reflect on his own past. Now you get kind of emotional about it, why? I did a lot of this restoration. My wife was battling cancer. And I lost her a year ago. Steve asked visitors for a free will donation, of which the proceeds go to ovarian cancer research. I didn't do this as an investment or to make money. I did it to educate the young farmers of today so they do not forget why they have it so good today and what our ancestors did before us. Up next, now this is fun. Steve takes us out of the shed and into the fields. No way where we'll witness magic. Do you know how much land is used to grow corn annually in the U.S.? A, an area the size of the Great Salt Lake. B, an area the size of Los Angeles. C, an area the size of Montana. Your answer's next when we return. Before the break, we asked you how much land is used to grow corn annually in the U.S. Is it A, an area the size of the Great Salt Lake, B, an area the size of Los Angeles, or C, an area the size of Montana? The answer is C, an area the size of Montana, which roughly equates to 90 million acres. <laughs> 